Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are going to maybe finish Romans chapter 8 today. We'll be trying to go through Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. My plan is to read through those verses right now and then go through the notes. And what's going to come up today is the topic of predestination. It's going to be a term. It's in the Bible. We are going to identify it. And I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you how I deal with it, how I explain it. But I also understand that there are some very good scholars on the other side that explain it a different way. Uh, I'm not going to come down on, say, the Armenian side, but I'm not going to come down on the Calvinistic side. Um, it's something that I understand. I think it makes sense for me. But obviously, uh, this is a debate that's going to go on forever. It may even be in that category of a mystery. And C.S. Lewis may have explained it the best. On this side, it seems one way. Once you cross over into eternity, it's obvious on another side. But the reason Paul is writing about it here at all is not a theological debate or trying to establish theological ground, but as a source of encouragement to the Romans. I believe chapter 8 is kind of his concluding on his theological, his explanation of being justified, of, of being in Christ, and of being now in, in, on a pattern of, of maturing and becoming productive in the kingdom of God. And this is his closing argument for... Uh, telling you, you're, you're going to make it. You are in Christ, and he is going to make sure you succeed. You stay with Christ, he's going to, he's going to end up manifesting, the, conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. And I think that kind of leads into chapter 9, because chapter 9, I feel, is going to switch directions, because he's going to now start talking about a case that can be used against what he has just said in chapter 8, of like, you know, we're going to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then he says in chapter 9, he begins, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So he just got done in chapter 8. He's going to close down addressing those that are predestined, those that are chosen, those that God foreknew that he called. He's going to do all these things with that's the people of Rome, the believers in Jesus Christ. He then backs off and says, now, there's another group of people that are the, are the chosen. Are, they call, he says, and he says, it, it tears me up. He says, I'm willing that I wish I could be accursed and cut off if I could somehow help them see the potential that they've got. So he's talking in a sense about two people here. He's talking about the church and those that God has now brought into the kingdom of God. But he's also looking back over his shoulder at the Old Testament saying there was another group of people that that had the same opportunity, but they've, they've drifted away. And he begins, and that's in chapter 9, he begins to explain to the Romans, chapter 9, 10, 11, about that situation with, with Israel. And again, I think it all fits together. Uh, the, the words, the predestined, the calling, the chosen ones are going to be mentioned. And I think you can see clearly in Romans 9, 10, 11 that this chosen group that God is going to choose, if it be Israel or if it's going to be, you know, the elect that people talk about, that, that is going to be in chat, later on, chapter 9, 10, 11, Paul's going to talk about the Jews being chosen and the Gentiles not being chosen, but a time has come where the Gentiles, the not chosen ones, are now his chosen ones, and those who are the chosen have been set aside. So it kind of attacks that whole concept of you know, predestined that, that there's no free will, you're just locked in. It's like the chosen, I'm going to sum up this way, I'm going to start reading. The chosen is the, the nation of Israel. You've been chosen for this plan. The plan is this, but you can, you're free to walk away from it. But this is the plan. If you choose to walk in this plan, you are going to be in this group. The same thing, Christ is chosen, and in Christ there's this destiny, there's this plan. And if you accept the calling, if you come into this, you will be conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And once you step into this plan, you're, you're in. You, and again, that's where I get eternal security from. Once you accept Jesus Christ, you're in this plan. There's no way you're going to get out of it because you have been transformed into the image of Jesus Christ and you're going to continue to mature. Of course, there's the plan, in a sense, has been predetermined. Now, you're going to have to decide as we go through this how it all falls out. That's the way I put it together. And it, it well, let's read it. And I'm going to read chapter... Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to the end of the chapter, and then I'm going to read into the first few verses again of chapter 9, just so you can kind of see the transition and how he's switching subjects, but now that exactly the, the switching subject, he's building on the case where he just left the church off at. And he is closing down his theology with the church in chapter 8, I believe. So here we go, chapter 8, verse 28. And we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? Here's the encouraging words right here. If that's the, if that's the scenario, if that's how the board is set, what shall we say? And it's supposed to be encouraging. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish for my, in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the, my, the sake of my own brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. There's the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. See right there he says in verse 6, it is not as though God's words failed. The whole Old Testament is based on the concept of Israel was given everything and called, and then now they're at the place where they're being set aside and God has moved on. And he's saying right there, what, did God's word fail? I mean, did, did God fail? He says, no. He says, because not everyone that was given that opportunity was in Israel. They, Israel was given a promise, but not everyone responded to it. And so some never really got into the situation or got into the, the plan of God. And so again, in a sense, he's, he's closing with this great encouragement to the church about us being in Christ. But yet at the same time, looking over his shoulder at Israel saying, they were also in that position, but because they didn't respond appropriately, the chosen became the unchosen. The call became the uncalled. And same thing here. We are the ones that are now responding. And we're going to get now into the notes, if you don't mind. <clears throat> uh, I've got seven pages of, of new notes, and potentially we'll finish them today. But, of course, if we don't, we'll finish them next week. And, and this gets into some technical, I don't want to say technical writing, because it's coming from the hand of a shop teacher, so I mean, I understand. But I do cut and paste some of the, the Greek and put the text together on these, so you can see some of the words. Some of the words that are going to pop up here that are, are, are important is the word purpose, and there's the Greek writing for it, uh, foreknowledge, predestined, determined. And one of the things that's interesting about these, P-R-O, or pro, you got the pi, the rho, the omicron right there. In all three of these words, P-R-O, and the P-R-O, or pro in the Greek, means before. So every one of these words, purpose, foreknowledge, and predestined are going to pop up as you see them in here. Pro, 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 it means before <coughs> this, before this, before this. The next words are coming up as far as purpose here, and here's the word you can hear, uh, foreknowledge is gnosko and which is referring foreknowledge. And that's how the whole chapter begins, and this whole section begins in chapter 8, verse 28. And we know. And that's just how I'm going to point that out. It's one of the first things on the notes there. Uh, our faith is based in what we know. And he begins right there. Is, I write, write, write it down in the notes. Our faith and our understanding is based in what we know. Bible teaching gives us information or special revelation upon which to base our knowledge. And so once again, it's not how you feel, it's not what your culture is saying, it's not how Hollywood interprets the spiritual realm, it's not the spiritual dimension itself, it's the revelation that God has given us and this is what we know. For we know these things and God is communicating to us 
at Romans address at the beginning, communicates with us through creation. God's presence is revealed in creation. God's nature is revealed in creation. But God has also chosen the vehicle of language, communication, of writing. I mean, it sounds awful modern, but God chose language to communicate to mankind. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's Word created everything. And so for us to separate, well, we want to get into feelings. We want to get into the spiritual. It's like, no, the very creator of the universe decided to use language as a form of communication. The written, he used prophets who spoke and wrote. He used apostles who spoke and wrote. It's recorded here. And the people say, well, that's kind of strange that it's all limited to a book. It's like... Actually, it's not strange. It would be strange that if you didn't have any kind of record, any kind of recollection, and every individual was to go out there and supernaturally make contact with this spirit by themselves. Well, now you're into the demonic world. That's where John talks about. There are many voices out there. God has chosen to make it clear in writing. So right here, it begins by saying, for we know. And how do we know? We know through the written word. We know through the revelation. And the topic here is God's will from Romans 8, 27. All things, it says, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And here we've got a list of things that are specifically, I think, being addressed as far as all things. So all things, of course, means all things. But the things that have been in context in this chapter are listed A through G is sufferings, bondage to decay, groanings as in the pains of childbirth, waiting for our adoption as sons, waiting patiently in our weakness we do not know what to pray we are on this side and we are we are limited in all these things we're being it's going to work out in all the our confusion all of our loss and all of our state of incompleteness it's all being worked out and so again it means all things but i think in context here is all these things that he's talking about are being are working together. And the next phase right there, uh, work together, means to cooperate or work together to work out with one another to assist. So all these things, God knows where we're at. And we left off last week talking about the Spirit praying for us or pro- praying with us through words or groans that cannot be expressed. In other words, we are praying for ourselves in our understanding of God's plan. We can read the text of Scripture. We know our needs, our desires. We know what God has placed in our hearts. And we can pray. But God has sent His Spirit to us also, who is also praying in a more perfect way in line with God's plan. Because the Spirit, who is God, sees God's plan. And He's also interceding for us. Not just me looking at situations and praying. I wish this would work out. Lord, help this situation. The Spirit is also praying. In, 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 in with words that cannot be expressed or with phrases, warnings. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I, you know, I just mentioned about tongues last week. People say, well, that must be tongues. It, it doesn't need to mean tongues. It means the Spirit is, He's not waiting for you to speak in tongues before He can pray for you. Once the Spirit comes, the concept is you're praying as you see situations from your human viewpoint, but the Spirit that God sent to live in you, which is His Holy Spirit, sees God's plans and sees this. He's also interceding for you to bring about God's plan for your life. That doesn't mean you don't pray. That means the Holy Spirit is also praying, trying to bring, and that goes into this next verse. So all things are working together, even the things that you don't know how to pray. I don't even know what to ask for. I don't even know who to vote for. Very good. Then just understand, God is working these things out. The Spirit is working. You're never, in a sense, hopeless. And so that being said, uh, chapter 8, verse 28, uh, and we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, a couple of other things we need to identify in there is the word good. I think it's coming up here. Oh, uh, the word, uh, yeah, I guess that's the next thing. Uh, good uh, does not mean that all things eventually become good things. I make that clear. That doesn't mean that everything that is bad eventually becomes good because evil is going to always be evil. Righteousness is always going to be righteous. And so good is not going to become, or evil is not going to become good. It can be used to produce good, and that's kind of what we're talking about here, is in the production of good. Evil can be used to produce the good. Satan can be used in God's plan to produce good. Satan's never going to be good. Sin is never going to be good. Evil's never going to be good. But they cannot overcome God's plan. In God's plan, Satan, sin, evil are all part of the formula that he's going to use to produce good. They will be removed. There will be a lake of fire. Satan will be removed. All death will be thrown away. It will be eliminated. 
moving into the future will be the completeness of God. Now, I point this out too. It should be said, I mean, help to understand this. The Western mind that is set on pleasure and material finds it abstract to consider carried to be a good thing. God is conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. There's a transformation being taken place. And we are focused on, as we know, uh, stuff, wealth, power, health. And so we're not so interested in becoming the image of Jesus Christ or becoming the character of Jesus Christ. But when you read the New Testament, it is about conforming into the image of his son. That is where we're heading. And so in eternity, it's not going to matter how much we have, the gold, the silver. It's not going to matter how powerful we were. It's going to matter the nature of God that was manifest in us. How far did we mature into the image of Jesus Christ? How are we being transformed? And again, we are righteous in Christ, but we are still maturing, becoming like his son. Now again, that's not dismissing. We see Jesus in his ministry solving worldly problems taking care of situations that people were in need. That, that, that's not dismissing it, but it's putting a broader definition on the word good. What we would say, yes, children, what is good? You ask people in church, what is good? They'll give you a list of all the pluses and benefits of life. And over here would be all the negative things, struggles and trials and difficulties. Well, all those things are part of the package that you have to break. Football team. you got a football team that doesn't want to lift weights or work out. We just want to win games and show for the trophy presentation. Well, it's like to get to the trophy presentation, you're going to have to go through the workouts, the training. And the, well, that's part of the heart. A football player who's had any experience and a coach who's got experience realizes you begin a championship team by doing these things. Well, how is it any different in our lives? And again, I don't want to go through difficulties, but it's going through those difficulties you begin to mature and, and be conformed. Now, the next part is at the bottom of there, those who love God. I write this. The New Testament rarely speaks about us as loving God. It's always God that is loving us and us responding to him. The Old Testament people of God were those who loved God. In other words, those who loved God in the Old Testament were the people of God. So you've got the people of God were those who loved God. The reason I'm saying that is I'm going to make this very simple blanket statement, which you don't have to accept. When he says those who love God is referring to those who have responded to Jesus Christ. You reject Jesus Christ, you do not love God. You accept Jesus Christ, you place faith in Jesus Christ, you love God. And that's the end of that discussion. We're not going to get over here and, and say, well, I love God. Some, and now you're talking about some kind of a you know, teenage relationship. You know, it's like, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are those who have loved God. You are in the plan. It is not a matter of loving God more or those you know, drifting back and forth in this ever-changing relationship. You are in Christ. You've responded by faith to Christ. You are one of those who love God. You are the people of God. And that's where I'm going to leave that at. You can think about that more and get into more of a discussion. But that, otherwise, where are you going to get the definition of those who love God? Well, I love God. I love God. I post about God all the time on my Facebook page. I really love God. I put memes up all day long about my love for God. Yeah, I don't think it's talking about that. Whenever I order something at a restaurant, I always say, you know, praise God and, or something. It's like, I love God more. It's like, how do you love? You, you've accepted Jesus Christ. You are those who love God. That's how I'm going to leave it, like that. Now, the next phase, it says, according to the purpose. And there's one of our words, professin, right here, professin. And that is the purpose. It means the plan, the will, the resolve, the purpose. God has a plan. God has a will. This has nothing to do, that we're not talking about foreknowledge or predestination. We're talking about God having a plan. God has a will. And so, again, read this understanding. We put this in context. And we know that in all things, again, we have knowledge of all things, no matter how bad it is or good, God works for the good of those who love him. God is working on your behalf. His plan is working on your behalf for those who love him. And I think that means if you're accepted Christ, you're in the plan of God. Who have been called according to his purpose. Again, called according to his purpose. There's this calling. And we're going to get into the word calling as far as who has been called, who has not been called. According to his purpose or called to his plan. And the, the calling, it's going to be an interesting word. Uh, when we, we think about who has been called. Some would want to say there's a group over here that has not been called and they never will be called. There's a group over here that has been called. And then they're going to you start pushing it. If you have been called, you have to respond. If you go straight down Calvinistic Road, and again, I, I don't agree with it, 
but far be it from me to be critical and stand in the face of the legends who are defending it, uh, but it doesn't make sense to me. And I, I can teach it without going Calvinistic, so I don't feel the need for it. But Calvinists would have, once they say they're called and God has called them according to their plan, then they've got to respond. They, they, if you're called, you have to respond. You have no choice. And these over here that are not called, well, if they were called, they'd have to respond too. So they don't even get called. They're not even invited. They're just over here destined for damnation. They're born, live and die, and they're never going to be called. But those who are called, they're not really called and invited. They're not given a chance to make a decision. They're just called and forced to come. And so there's really, as you go through this, it becomes, for me, it becomes so abstract that it boggles my mind. I can't even... If I really were to accept Calvinism, I would have to almost stagger back as a teacher and say, I, I, I don't really understand it. Because it's like, it's just whatever God wants. It's like he called, well, then he, okay, I'm not going to go down that track. But for me, those who are called is going to be a broader section here of those who are called and there's going to be a response. People are going to be, they're going to respond to the calling. Now, we're going to have to work with that as we go. Um... Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 it says in him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. I want to jump over where is this on page I don't know if I want to do yeah I'm going to do this now go to page 5 this might help me get some traction page 5 at the top there's Ephesians chapter 1 and I know we're switching books and we're trying to close up what Paul is saying in, in Romans chapter 8. But in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, you're going to have these things right here. I'm going to read chapter 1, verses 4 through 13. And the first thing you're going to see in chapter 1, verses 4 is, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. And this gets to this category right here of this group. There's a group. This group is in him. Just like Israel was a group. Israel. Israel has been chosen. And Israel will succeed. Israel will succeed. In the, as we go through on Tuesdays, we're going through uh, 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 the Titanic faith. We're talking about Israel in the end. They will, although they side with the Antichrist, then they get on the Temple Mount for three and a half years, at some point that covenant is broken and they realize... <coughs> They have to change. They, have, they realize they've turned against the Messiah. And they are going to then, as a group, there's going to be a group that will fulfill the purpose of, of Israel being called at that point in history. And, and, and as throughout history, Israel's been a, been a purpose. But not everyone who is born into Israel is in this group. Israel is called. Many of the Israelites never make it in to the plan of Israel. Israel has a plan. Not everyone born in Israel is part of that plan. You've got to join the plan. And the same thing is him. In Christ is this plan. And we are all out here. This is the plan. This is the predestined. This is it. When you enter this, boom, you're in the plan. You are not predestined. This plan is predestined. And so when you enter this plan... You're in the plan. You're now predestined to finish. Israel, when they join this, they will fulfill. Israel will ultimately fulfill God's plan for their lives, for their, for their existence. So the next point there, uh, I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 13. He chose us in him. The next part, verse chapter 1, verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. So we're going to be adopted. We're predestined. Once you enter this... You've now hit predestination, and you're going to be adopted as the sons through Jesus Christ. Out here, you're not predestined. But you enter this, you're going to be predestined to be adopted as his sons. The next thing, chapter 1, verse 11. Predestined according to his plan. Predestination is for those who are in the plan. To be in the plan for Christ, you must be in Christ. In other words, ultimately, this plan, I'll write, I have him written there. But this plan is Christ. Christ is on the fast track. He is on the way to glorification. If you don't want to say he's already glorified. But he is there. And we're going to share. We're going to be conformed into his image. Which means 
going into his glory, going into the same thing. We're going to be conformed into his image. So it's not outside, it's in Christ. Christ is the one who's predestined. And chapter 1, verse 13, you also, now watch, this is for me. He's like, well, I don't know, I don't know. I don't understand it. This is a tough thing. But there's a verse coming up in chapter Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Watch this. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. When were you included in this predestination? You were included when you heard the word of truth. Before you heard the word of truth, you were out here. You maybe went to church, you maybe were religious, maybe you didn't know, but you heard the word of truth and responded, you were included in this plan. Now I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 13, please. And here we go, and you're free to think on your own. I'll begin at verse 3. Praise be the God our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So in this, in Christ, you have every possible spiritual blessing. And remember, it's in the heavenlies. It's not, you know, in your local temporal worldly situation in a fallen, cursed world that is laboring and striving and living in vanity. It's not here. You're not going to access it here. It's something that's going to manifest. This is a land of vanity. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He didn't put us in there, but we were chosen in him. This right here, Christ was chosen. This plan was established. And if you're going to get in that plan, you're going to go there. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. There's that word right we talk about will. His pleasure and will was for Christ to be the firstborn, Christ, his son, to be the one who inherited everything, to be this. And he also included in that plan a place for us. I don't think it's saying you're stuck in there. This group is predestined. You have no choice. You're going to go here, and you guys have no hope at all. It's this plan was there. What he's talking about, we're getting excited about Christ. We're getting excited about this plan. This is going to the top. Now, you were included in verse 11, say, when you heard the word of truth and believed. You were on the outside orbiting this. This is the plan. This is God's will. In his side, okay, I'm going to go in, in, in verse, I'll try, try to find a verse to begin with. I've got to go to verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. His grace is freely given us in the one he loves. In him, in Christ, in that circle, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. That's kind of neat. He made known, this right here is kind of abstract, kind of strange. He made known to us this mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. So through the apostles, he revealed, we've got it in writing, what's going on here. Otherwise, you'd have to make it up on your own. You had to go to some priest on some mountain somewhere and you know, burn some incense and ask, what do you think is going on? He, out of the God's good pleasure, he, he revealed this to us. Okay, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So in the end, at the right time, everything is going to come into this and be under Christ. This is, in a sense, the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Then in verse 11. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Do you see, I think for me, that, that really helps get some grip on what I'm talking about. Otherwise, 
Those first verses can all be really abstract. God just stuck you here at the beginning of time. You have no choice. You're just going to end up here. You're just floating through. You just, you know, you're predestined. Nothing's going to happen. But right here on this part, it says, verse 13, and you also were included in Christ. You weren't in this. Christ was in this. God's plan was in this. That's what was predestined. You were also included when you heard the word of truth, which is what? The gospel of your salvation. Having believed, see, you had to respond to it. If you said, mm, I don't believe it, I'm sorry, you're predestined. You'll be going on the first train to Christ. It's like, I don't want to go. I don't believe in God. I'm sorry, even atheists have to go. It's the word of truth. You're predestined. Now, again, the, 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 there's answers for all of those foolish statements I just made. Having believed, you are marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where Paul just finished last week, when we were talking last week, has now come into you and is helping you pray to help understand all these things. So this thing comes about in your life. You're not just on your own praying. I just want to pray and understand. The Holy Spirit's with you also, helping you pray. This is God's plan. This is God's Son. And you've got God's Holy Spirit. They're all the Trinity. You're in this, and they're going to make sure you succeed in that. That's how Paul's ending chapter, this is part of reading in chapter 8. And again, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. See, once you have that Holy Spirit, it's a, now you're guaranteed. That's, again, confirming for me eternal security. Because once you're here, you're not only in Christ, not only predestined, but you've been given the Holy Spirit, which is a guarantee you're not going to lose. And Paul writes at the end of chapter 8, Who's going to separate us from this? And this is, you say, the love of God, the love of God. Don't go Western on me, right here. This is the love of God. This plan is the love of God. Not an emotional state. Who's going to separate me from the love of God? Not the hardships. How many times has hardship separated you from experiencing uh, an emotional relationship with God? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, have, have you ever felt darkness? Have you ever felt hopelessness? I mean, yes. I mean, I have felt times, it'll, it'll happen this week sometime. Where you're just like, oh, it's Monday again. And you just feel, you don't feel that love of God because of situations or times or depressions or arguments. Or, it's like you can emotionally be separated from that emotional connection to the love of God. We're not talking about that love of God like a Western emotional thing, like you know, a rock and roll song. We're talking about here, this is the love of God. You may feel like you're in darkness, but if Paul's saying you can't be. You may feel you're separated and you're alone. You can't be. You are in Christ. Do you understand kind of what I'm saying? When, when it says separate us from the love of God, instantly it's like, well, I just feel the love of God. You know, sometimes I don't feel the love of God. Sometimes I feel lost. But I know, based on what has been revealed, nothing can say. I may feel lost, so I just suck it up and keep going. Because guess what? I'm on the fast. I am in this plan. Okay, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Uh, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Okay, I just wanted to read that kind of, kind of clarify kind of what I'm seeing here, what I'm saying. And I hope that kind of helps us go back to chapter 8, verse 28. For we know that in all things, all the difficulties, everything in this vain world, God works for the good, and that good is more than just money and fame and power. It's mainly character. It's mainly maturity. It's God's plan. Works for the good of those uh, who have been good of those who love him, who are in it, that mean love him are those who have accepted Christ, who have been called according to his purpose. And if you, have, are, if you love God, that means you've responded positively towards Jesus Christ, that means you are now called, you've been called, you've responded to the call according to his purpose. And his purpose is, that's where this comes in, this plan, this will, this is his purpose, this right here. With you or without you, this is his purpose. He's now invited you in and you have joined this purpose. For those who God foreknew, now there's your word, pro ginosko. we've already used the word purpose. Now, Prognosco or pro knowledge, meaning you know ahead of time. For those God foreknew, He also predestined. That again is another word that starts with pro, P R O. And here's the word, it's similar to the word right here. It, it is that word, it's just, it, it's, it's from the word horizon. It means to determine or appoint. It's, it's something in, in the future, it's determined, it's appointed. 
Uh, here's our words, pro before, gnosko, knowledge. Now we're in this word, poridzo. It's going to pop up several times. And the endings, you've got to be careful in the Greek because the endings sometimes help give it a different form or different, not, not meaning, but a different place in the language. But basically it's the word horizon or where we get the word horizon from. It means determine or appoint. This right here, predestined, has the word pro, before. And here's that word. You can see the O, R right there. And again, in the Greek, there's no H, so it would be done like this. And the uh, H has got this little rough breathing mark right there, which gives you the sound. So there's right there is your word. So this is before, and this is your word. It means to mark out with a boundary. It means to determine. It means to appoint. But because of the pro, it means beforehand. It's before anything is established, you mark it out. It's saying the plan... The purpose has been marked out with a boundary before we even begin. So before God says in the beginning, God says, let there be light. Before all that, there is a predetermined, there is already boundary set. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, this is already established. This is where we're going. This is the destiny of, of what God's plan is. And so this is, these are the words that are saying this. Verse 29. For those God foreknew. That is going to mean pro, before, knowledge. God knew ahead of time. I mean, for, folks, for me, it's, it's simple, except for that echoing of that crazy philosophy of Calvinism that, that confuses the waters. God, it's like God knows everything. So God knows beforehand who's going to respond to the call, according to God's foreknowledge. I mean, nothing happens without God knowing it. Nothing happens without God having it planned ahead of time. You can't surprise God. So, read this again. Again, you've got to criticize me. You've got to think. You don't need to just agree with me because there's thousands of people, scholars, who would just bury me in my teaching right here. For those God foreknew, he had knowledge beforehand of those, those people. He also predestined. He also set boundaries for him. And this is the boundaries. So if God knew you, when he called, we're going to respond to the call. He foreknew you. He also has a place in Christ for you prepared. Meaning just as surely as God's plan for Christ was for the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and his ruling and reigning. He had that plan for Christ. Within Christ, in him, in this plan, there's a place for you. They're like, oh, guess who just got born again? Well, come on in. Sit right here. Well, we got another one. What do we do with him? He's waiting for you to respond and enter this predestination. Now, so he's predestining everything. No, he's predestining. He is going to do this. You can't stop it from doing it. All heaven, hell, Satan, everybody can work it. It's all going to work out. Satan comes against it. I can use that. It's like, I, I guess, martial arts. You know, always use the other person's momentum, but I don't know anything about it. I don't even know how to fight properly. So, but, you know, they always use their momentum against themselves, you know. They, they, and and that, the same thing. Satan attacks. God says, fine. Just use the momentum. You just pro Crucifixion of Jesus Christ in classic stuff. It's going to come up in Acts. It was Satan's great plan, his great attack. Killed Jesus Christ. It's like, thank you. That's exactly what we needed. We needed the Messiah to suffer and die for the sins of the world. Thank you, stepped right into the inside. We destroyed him. No, you didn't. You just moved the plan forward. It's like, how are we ever going to beat this? You can't because he's already planned it from the beginning of time. It's all planned, and he knows who's going to respond. So when he responds, say, I'm in. Great. You sit right here. I was waiting for you, and here's your plan. And the Holy Spirit comes into your life now. You pray, the Holy Spirit prays, and everything that comes against in this vain world against you, it'll work out. It's going to help you conform into the image of Jesus Christ. There's no, in a sense, forcing predestination. You have to get in here. But there's the, the Lord, the God who created the world, has a plan prepared for you, waiting for you to respond. And when you do get here, it's not a, like an emergency situation. It's like it was all planned on what you're going to do. Even Satan can't come against this plan without it benefiting the plan. That's the way I understand it. That's the way I teach it. Other people want to say, well, it's the line you're in, you've got to come here, and you're just, it doesn't matter what you do. 
Uh, they'll try and make it sound like some motivational speech you got to try. Out of God, out of, out of respect for God, you got to look what it did for you. You better do good things. It's like, uh, okay. Verse 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn, his son, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brothers. The firstborn, we could go on and do a little study on that. The firstborn means the one with the, the largest portion, the one who receives the full inheritance. He's the one who inherited the firstborn. And he's going to have the firstborn, he's going to have many brothers. I mean, think of them. Millions, millions of people who are going to be in this plan and because of Christ are being conformed into his image, receiving his eternal inheritance. You're in Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those he predestined. Now, who did he predestine? Those in this plan. So if you are in this plan... You are now predestined. You're not predestined to accept Christ, but once you accept Christ, you're in this, that he know you're going to accept Christ. No one's going to surprise him. That, was, that person was so, so bad, and then they got saved. Like, wow. Didn't know they were going to respond. I never anticipated that. God knew that. He didn't make them. The very God who gave you free will is not afraid of free will. He's not afraid of Satan upsetting his plan. And that's been said before that guy could go on on this whole discourse. It's like, if, if man has free will and he gets to choose, what about God's, God's supremacy? What about God's superior? What about God's sovereignty? If God is sovereign, we just merely respond to his whims. It's like, that sounds good on a very, very, very basic elementary plan. But if God is sovereign, first of all, if God is sovereign, do whatever he wants to, he can give you free will. And still maintain sovereignty. Oh, God can't do that. Well, now you're the one saying God isn't sovereign. It's like God can do. God could be sovereign, maintain His sovereignty, and give you free will and say, "How do you run and respond to my sovereignty?" And then when you respond, He goes with it. The very fact that He's got Satan over here, who's entirely working against His plan, and He's not at all worried about it. In fact, I mean, I can give you all the examples. Job situation, Peter. Jesus is saying, uh, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. So I prayed for you because he's going to sift you like wheat. Well, aren't you going to stop him? It's like, no. I'm not afraid of Satan. And I don't think God's afraid of my free will upsetting his sovereignty. I can have, sovereign, I can have free will and make my choices and respond to God. And him knowing ahead of time how I'll respond, he can prepare for it. But my, my free will is not going to throw God's sovereignty in the drain. He is still sovereign, if that makes sense. Okay, so, and those he predestined, meaning he foreknew our response in our free will, he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also just, that call is like, you know, invited, calling you, sending you to this place. And once he calls you, he also, what's the next thing that takes place? Justifies you. That's the first parts of Romans of where you're justified by faith. You believe in Christ, and now once you enter into this, you are justified. You're not here a sinner. You're here justified in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those he predestined, he also justified, called, he also justified. And those he justified, that's you and me right now. We're now justified. He will or he also glorified. And glorified is taking us to that state of, of the resurrection. Now, we, that word glorified is in the, in, in the sense that it's past tense. It's already been glorified. So there's a couple ways of looking at this. If I go to the typical way that I've been saying glorified, glorification is the third phase of salvation. First phase is justification, the removal of the penalty of sin. The second phase is the, is the, uh, the sanctification, the removal of the power of sin in your life now. And then the third phase is the removal of the presence of sin and you're glorified in your resurrected body. That would be where I see glorified. And I think it's not hard to put that in the past tenses. It's, that's all because we're talking outside of time, predestined. These things are done. You're, you're, you're glorified now. I mean, it's already, you're not, it hasn't manifested yet. We're waiting for the fullness, but it's already done per se in the plan of God. So that's one way of looking at it. glorified. You'd also say glorified, which I have a hard time pushing this, but we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We do have the spirit of God in us. We are in a sense in Christ. So we're already in this plan. So 
But I think that's repeating what we've already talked about. I think glorification is yet a process yet to come where we are resurrected and in the eternal state in our glorified bodies. But nonetheless, there's that, that sequence. Predestined, called, justified, glorified. With that being said, and again, the whole, this is not a theological writing. I mean, Paul is not trying to argue. If he would, I mean, he does this in what? Four verses. I mean, there have been 4,000 volumes written on, and more in this last century, on those four verses. So if Paul is trying to explain predestination and all of this stuff that we want to get into, and I want to get into, he could have done a little more thorough job, maybe a little outline, maybe use some Old Testament examples. So clearly his point is not to teach or make clear predestination so you don't end up with people on different sides. He's assuming this truth, and he's using this truth to encourage the Romans that there's nothing you need to worry about. God has your back. You've accepted Christ. You're in the plan. The Spirit is with you. And now there's nothing going to separate you. You may face hardships, but that's just going to spur you on closer to the image of Jesus Christ. You may face trials, but that's just going to force you to become more like Jesus Christ. And that's where he's going to be. So this is all. He's closing down his whole theological argument that began in chapter 1, running through chapter 8. So understand, you don't understand what I'm saying. I mean, I want to continue down this path and start ironing this out some more. But we lose track of what Paul's doing here. Because now he concludes this. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he, he glorified. Now, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? Well, what is your response going to be? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who could ever, if Satan can't interfere with this, and you're inside this, who is going to throw you off track? Well, you maybe could, you know, start, start smoking cigarettes and then the whole thing just falls apart. It's like, yeah, okay, that's so, uh, no, my gosh, no. Cigarettes is a health issue, not a salvation issue. Okay, you, you, you see what I'm saying right there. I hope we didn't offend anybody. Okay. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, on this note, I'm going to find, I've got to flip back and find this. Maybe i got to go forward. Oh, yes, page 6. In the middle it says 833. There's, there's uh, six ways of punctuating this. And again, in, remember, in the Greek, there's no punctuation. It's just, in the Greek originally, you don't want to know this, but originally the Greek was written See like how I've got these Greek letters here? Those are minuscule. Those are, those are the script that were developed later on by monks or others, even in the secular Greek. But when Paul wrote his Greek letters, uh, let's say, I'll, I'll use like this verse, for God so loved the world. You see, that, that's, they wrote all capitals. That's how they wrote. Just, and no punctuation. You, you, it was difficult because it's like, you, your mind can break these apart. You're, you know, they see those little games and stuff you can play. That's how the Greek, and they wrote in straight columns like this. And once you went to L-O-V-E-D, you just kept around and going. That's how the New Testament letters were written. Those are called the uncials. Those are when you find something like that, you've got some old material. They then began to put it in script form, and they'd write in small letters for... God, so, and they began to space it out. But the scribe, this is why te biblical uh, textual criticism comes in, because if you misread this and put the word, you can take a word and replace, maybe take the ending of this word and make it the beginning of that word accidentally, because you're trying to read through it. Those are mistakes were made. This is the way we see most of our manuscripts are written like this. My whole point for saying that is there is no punctuation in the Greek. There's not even breaks between words in the Greek. So you just wrote. 
That's how they did it. So that's why this is a safe statement to say there are six ways of punctuating chapter 8, verses 33 through 34. And if there may, some are going to be obviously contradicting the point. Some are going to be in more support. Some might support one theology over another theology. But basically, here it is. You can make every statement in verses 33 and 34 a question. So you'd have a total of seven questions. The other thing, you can make four questions. Who shall bring a charge? Is not God justifying? Who condemns? Is not Christ Jesus interceding for us? Or you can make two questions followed each by a statement. Who shall bring a charge? God has justified us. Or who shall condemn us? Jesus Christ is interceding for us. I like that. I think, there's two, I think in this there are two questions. The two questions would be, basically, who will bring a charge against us? I mean, God has already justified us. Who's going to charge me with something in this circle? Any charge? Who's going to say, accuse me of something when God himself has already justified me in Christ? Meaning, you can't even accuse me of anything. And the next question would be, who will condemn us? Who is the one on the bench that's going to condemn us? In the end, who's the judge? Jesus Christ. But he's the one who died for me. And Paul goes on and says, man, meanwhile, he's interceding for me right now. He, I mean, we, we've got the courtroom bought off. I mean, this is the biggest political scandal to hit eternity. It's like we've got the judge and we've got God working for us. So we just show up. It's like, who's going to charge us right here? Then all of a sudden the FBI shows up and starts reading our emails or something. All right. <laughs> So anyway, base number four, could anyone accuse us? God has justified us. Could anyone condemn us? Could Christ Jesus condemn us? No, he has died for us. He was raised to life and is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Who will bring any charge? And again, kind of get the idea there. So that's kind of the point right there is basically Paul makes his argument, makes his statement, and step back and says, okay, now give me an example. Who could condemn us? Who could bring a charge against us? The very people that the last person in line that could bring a charge against maybe you can't, maybe you can't, but at the end, God knows everything. Okay, I'll go there. God can't because he justified me. Who's going to condemn me? None of you don't know the story, but Jesus Christ says, yeah, but he died for me so that I would be in this position of not being judged. So Paul's saying, you guys, we've got a great deal. Again, he's not arguing for or against Calvinism or Arminianism. He's trying to make a point that you are in Christ and you're on the fast track and at the end, you're in a very good position. Next thing it says. Um... So then he goes in verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Now here's your eternal security. So while you're here, God and Jesus are in your, on your side. They brought you here, they got you here. But what happens if you get separated? What happens if for some reason today you were here, but then you do something, you say something, you renounce Christ. Something happens and you leave. Now, you can, maybe Satan can't get you here, or judgment can't get you here, or condemnation can't get you in here. But once you come out here, oh my gosh, you're on your own again. Now you're going to get torn. So, what we need to be concerned about is not while we're in here, but we've got to look out for what could possibly get us out of this plan. The plan that we are in, the, we, are, we enter this plan that we're predestined in here, but could we leave this now that we're here? Oh my gosh. Now can you imagine, you know people go crazy if they believe they can lose their salvation. I mean, if you, if you, like, give me a list. Well, there's three ways you can lose your salvation. Well, no, I think there's four. Well, there's probably a lot more than that. And I was like, well, well, maybe it's just any sin, probably any sin, if you don't confess it before you die. That's it. That sounds right. Because if you sin willingly and you never confess it, you're outside of the plan, and now you've lost your salvation. Oh, my gosh. So I'm, I'm going to kill myself, but first I'm going to confess my sin of suicide, kill myself, and now I'm in. I mean, it's like, how, how, I mean, who wants to live another day with that opportunity? So, that's where Paul goes now. He says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Again, who shall separate us from this, this circle, this circle of love, this, this plan? Shall trouble? Now, all of these things could produce you, produce you for acting in such a way that would cause you to sin or renounce Christ. Or, so here it is. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Now, in every one of those situations, I could see myself falling away from Christ or renouncing Christ, especially that word uh, persecution. I mean, you start, you know, persecuting me, 
Now, all I got to do is renounce Christ, burn a little incense to the emperor or something like that. I mean, I'm standing up here today teaching with videotape and everything. But what happens if you start, like, pulling my fingernails out? It, it, it's like, uh, how strong? He says, could some of these things cause us to lose our place in this circle? And he says right here, as it is written, now he quotes an Old Testament verse that talks about the way it looks in this vain world that the people of God are like sheep to be slaughtered. Just line them up and slaughter them. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. Look what he says next. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. So every one of those situations, trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, all those situations, they're going to kill us. What, well, you look like just sheep to be slaughtered in this vain world. No. Because when you are slaughtered, you are not a sheep that was slaughtered. No, you are a victor that has accomplished now this purpose. You have now entered into eternity, into that plan. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Once again, it's not what you do. It's what he has done. You're in this circle. How do I stay in that circle? You're not going to leave that circle because you're in that circle. He is going to keep you in that circle. Yes, but look what I did. You're still in the circle. It's not a matter of getting back in the circle. It's now a matter of maturing and getting on with your growth, getting on with your life. For I am convinced, here's Paul, now here he is, I'll try and wrap this up. Paul says, for I am convinced, that's a strong word, that neither death nor life can separate you from the circle. Nothing that can happen in your life will separate you. Nothing that happens during your death can separate you from this. Neither angels nor demons, neither the spiritual forces of good or the spiritual forces of evil can get you out of that circle. Neither the present nor the future now that's interesting, because he's talked about the extremes here of our town, life or death, the extremes of the spiritual realm, demons or angels. Now he talks about neither uh, the present nor the future. There's nothing that can happen right now today, and nothing that you need to worry about that's coming in the future that can separate you from this. Now he's in a time. Uh, nor any powers, that could be supernatural, Neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation. The highest part of creation, the lowest part of creation. I mean, if you want to go to the bottom of the ocean, the highest mountain, go to outer space, there's nowhere you can go. There's no buddy, there's no thing, there's no time, there's no place. There's nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And what is the love of God? The love of God is in Christ. You are in this plan of salvation. Again, don't think love of God or love of God, uh, yeah, separation from love of God is some emotional connection. The love of God is you have entered in. You showed you love God when you accepted Christ. And now you are in this plan, and there's nothing that can separate you from this plan that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So with that, there, in my mind, there's no way you can argue for the fact that you could possibly lose your salvation. If you are in this circle... Now, you may not be in that circle, or you may be in that circle struggling. You may be in that circle completely ignorant and living like a spiritual loser. But if you are indeed in that circle, it, it, there's nothing that God has got you. You're in that plan. So, obviously, when we talk about Calvinism, one of the last points of Calvinism is eternal security. I'm down with eternal security. And all those other verses, we can talk about those. We've talked about that. Like, it talks about... Uh, uh, working out your salvation or something like this. We're talking about maturing in this circle. We're not talking about keeping your salvation. All right? Well, we're going to quit with that right now and pick up in chapter 9 next week and realize with that great ending, not my ending, Paul's great ending that I kind of botched up, but the great ending that Paul has in chapter 8, he leaves them hanging and he's using these kind of this idea of being God's chosen people and they're all looking over their shoulder going, wait a minute. Wasn't Israel God's chosen people? And look what happened to them. It's like, I, this is great. We're, yeah, all right, hey man, let's sing another song. But Paul, did Israel have something very similar to this? And God is now turning his back on them. Paul's okay, now, I want to address that. And he starts talking about, and I think even as we go through this, here's a good test of my teaching. Here's a good test of my teaching. If I can teach you chapters 9, 10, and 11, and not deviate from this, 
that's evidence that I'm on the right track. If I got to start monkeying around with the words and trying to make sure this doesn't get messed up, then it means that I need to go back and reteach chapter 8. You understand what I'm saying? Because if this is, in, this is Christ and we're in Christ, then we're going to talk about Israel being Israel and they are this nation. And there again, there's some great verses coming up that I think will support what we're talking about here. But uh, once again, you know, and I'll say again, this topic of, first of all, this topic right here is a, is a topic of victory. We are good in Christ. So that's, that's the point. But as far as all these meanings and these terms, you know, someone else can be write the same things on here, say this, use the same definitions and go a different direction with this. So I want you to be, in all fairness, I want you to know that. This is how I've come to reconcile it, because I can't go Calvinistic, I can't go Armenian, because Armenian, you can lose your salvation. This is where I'm at right now with this. So keep that in mind, keep studying. But again, it's a victory march is what this is. This is a victory march. Yes, sir? Ultimately, um it's fair to say, it seems to me that it's fair to say that ultimately God is the judge of who's in and who's out. Not, and I'm not mm -hmm. talking about right. the yep. and all that, but you know, I, I can just, we can all, probably everybody in this room, think of people we know who were raised in godly homes, have heard the truth, but only God's going to know if that person ever, and, and like as you talk in Chapter four, five, six. You know, they're either over here. They might be living in rebellion. They might. They might have accepted Christ as a as a child or as a young adult, and maybe they're over on this side. But at some point, there's got to come a point where they come back to the Lord. And if but if that never happens, then as I as I agree right. with your teaching, they never. Their heart right. never turned. Okay, when it says those who love and only God, love God the judge that. The, those who love God, they accepted Jesus Christ. But some people accepted the altar call because they love people. They love themselves. They're afraid of emotional. Whatever. They, they, they made a statement. It wasn't just like we, I mean, I'm not sure what everyone else would agree with, but just baptizing an infant doesn't get them saved. No more does responding to an altar call get you saved. It's got to be a matter of the heart. Yeah, I think when I'm looking forward to your teaching on, like you said, Romans 11, 19 through 23, because that's kind of the flip side of it, of being grafted, not being, being grafted back in uh, once they believe again. So, I mean, it's, it, well, yeah, what do you say? Well, if you read here, he says, you will say that branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell. Severity but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And I think that would be referring to groups. For example, Israel yeah. and the and the institutional church like in Rome meaning don't become too proud as the Gentile church because God can set you aside I know I'm sure if that's talking about like individuals being pulled out of Christ as much as I think it's a warning to the church because now you're now you're into group talk about groups there and I think that's a that's a great verse because it tells the church just like I could burn down Israel's temple and move on I can take the church and just walk away from your institutional organization here and, and move on with my plan. So not so much individuals. Is that what, or what are you thinking? Well, I think it does. Well, it's, I just don't think that there will one day you show up in heaven being an unbeliever. So if you characterize yourself as that I don't believe in Christ, I don't think you'll show up in heaven as an unbeliever. I don't think there's unbelievers in heaven. Right, yeah. yeah. So but one day I was a believer and then I then, as you said, truly yeah. in your heart, apart right. I think the judgment, only God knows. Right. If you truly don't believe in Christ, even though one day you profess it. Right. And yeah. That, that's where I leave it up to God. Yeah. It, and yeah I, I had a friend tell me. To heaven as an I had a friend explain one time that, and I didn't agree with it, but it's interesting that they, the person they, they they're into Christ, but God knows they don't have. The ability to maintain it, 
that he never really lets them come in. I mean, some of that effect. I mean, yeah, I mean, it gets, it gets, it gets real, it's real easy to talk about example A and B and C and D, but then you start getting all the other examples, and it gets, I think it goes past that. We can't understand it, but yeah. No, I don't, I think if you're, you're not going to go, if you're not a believer in Jesus, if you're not in Christ, but I also think that if you've accepted Christ, a spiritual transition, I mean, you've been born again. And I would just like you'd say, no unbeliever is going to enter into eternity. I would, I'd agree with that. But at the same time, if you've been born again, I mean, you've... Maybe then you truly never will fall away. You're, yeah. Well, now, yeah. See, now, see now right there, now I got to wrap it. Now you're in, not, not, not in the Calvinism, but that's what the Calvinists teach, is if you are, they want to know, right? Well, if you're teaching Calvinism and you're in, in Holland or something back in, you know, the 1700s, it's like, how do we know? How do we know if we're saved? Because it's like they got baptized as infants. They believe bap infant bap I know. Well, the true believers will show fruits of righteousness. Okay, okay. Well, now all of a sudden, now they're sweeping the streets and everything. It's like we look like me. Mean, also, now it becomes more of an emphasis on how good do I look? You know, do I look? Do you think I'm a believer? Look, I got my tie on, my shirt on. It's like yes, and it's like I look like a believer. And you're more. I mean, then they get wrapped up. In, and so now you got the trap of. Everyone looks like a believer, but their hearts are far. Now you're back, and now you're into religion. Yeah, but I, at that same time, it's true. The fruits should follow. I mean, there should be the fruits of salvation and fruits of maturity. So. I think it just matters that we encourage those that are not in belief to be believers. You know, but it's not ours to judge. We would just say, look at the fruit, and just say, we encourage you to live a righteous life. Right. You know, the scripture saying, if you're not, then I would just get a little... Bit you know, look in the mirror. Right, yes, right. Going on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got saved at a youth group back. Yeah, maybe you did, but maybe you need to reevaluate why why did you go forward and what does that mean? That's what, yeah. And I, oh, I got to quit. For me, this right here, you teach this week after week, Sunday after Sunday. That's like, that's like the, the, the medication that helps. If people come and hear this week after week, they, you know, it's kind of, it's easy to get saved and then get off into false teaching and say, well, whatever is, you know. But if you come week after week and hear that, it's going to be kind of hard to hold your feet to the fire. Not a behavior, but the feet, feet to the fire of the truth and not evaluate yourself. I know that. I mean, it happens to me. I, I, I study and I teach like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming. I'll pray. And, uh, Tony, is, this is not next week, right? No. So we're it's in here next week. We're in Two weeks we're in the media center, so in two weeks we'll be coming in the, the north doors. You can get there from these doors if you accidentally come in these doors to forget. You just keep going straight down that hallway so you can't go anymore, and then I'll try to remember how to do the whole thing. But you'll know when you get here because there's Little League basketball and there's a big swim meet going on, and they'll have this entire hallway cafeteria. So, so if you cover that, we think Generation Word has started a youth basketball program. <laughs> no, that is not what we've done. Are we going to have potato salad too? <laughs> yeah, and then we'll have a potluck right after that. <laughs> Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the truth we have before us. We ask that we'd handle it diligently, that we'd allow it to penetrate our hearts, that we would become the people you've called us to be at this time in history, and we look forward to celebrating in your victory and your glory and your kingdom in, in, in the soon coming future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. <laughs>